Hello and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. While President Donald Trump seems intent on doing everything he can to revive the coal industry, nuclear energy appears to be enjoying a resurgence in popularity driven largely by power-hungry data centers. The problem with that? We've never quite figured out how to safely store all of that spent fuel. And it's a problem that's about to get exponentially worse. What's on the table to address this need? For more on Nuclear's Moment, I am now joined by Allison McFarlane, Director of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. Allison chaired the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 2012 to 2014. Allison, thank you for joining me on the excerpt. Thanks for having me. Let's start with energy sources here in America. Oil and natural gas make up nearly three quarters of all of our energy consumption. Renewables like solar and wind had been steadily expanding as costs came down. And President Trump recently said he wants to bring back the coal industry. Both of those categories make up just under 10 percent each. This is 2024 data, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Nuclear energy is pegged at providing between 10 to 20 percent of our energy needs, according to different sources. Why expand nuclear and why now? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think there's another question there is, is it possible to expand nuclear now? Um, But the main reason to consider it is that it provides carbon-free electricity. And so it will not contribute to climate change. So that's the main reason to to consider it going forward. There are new reactors in Georgia as of last year, the first in decades, and plans for more in Michigan, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, all of which will produce nuclear waste that needs to be safely stored. Give us the broad strokes here on nuclear waste. How many tons of waste are we talking about each year? And where are we storing it now? And what are some of the issues at play? So we have now... 93 odd operating nuclear power plants, nuclear reactors around the country. They produce around in total 2000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel annually. And since they began operating in the late 1960s, we've accumulated in the US around 90,000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel that all lives at the reactor sites. That is not a long-term solution. Um, It's quite safe right now. It's either in spent fuel pools, literally very deep swimming pools, like objects at the at the reactor site, because you have to keep this fuel cool. It's very thermally hot. But of course, it's also radioactively hot. And once it cools to a certain degree, after about five years in the pool, you can move it into a dry cask, a basically very large concrete and steel cask that is put on a concrete pad and they sit out in the elements and passively continue to cool. Most nuclear power plants have these uh, dry casks as well as the spent fuel pools. The problem is the dry casks and the spent and the pools will not last forever. Uh, Maybe they'll last a hundred years, maybe, maybe not. And if you don't have a more permanent solution to manage this material, it will get into the environment and affect humans. So we don't want that to happen. Now, what basically is the conventional wisdom that many countries are pursuing uh, and that the U.S. was pursuing but is now stuck at an impasse was a deep geologic repository. And so that is the plan to put this material deep underground, uh, far away from other uh, elements and uh, and keeping it safe from getting into the environment and affecting humans. And are there locations that have been researched and looked at for this? Yes. In, in the United States, uh, the Yucca Mountain site in the state of Nevada was designated by Congress in 1987 in amendments to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act as the only site that the Department of Energy should consider when looking for a deep geologic repository. And why did this stall? Politics, which is the problem that we have on lots of issues right now, right? Um, 
Congress has not appropriated money to make any progress on this since 2010. So it's been stalled for a long time. The state of Nevada has never wanted this facility ever since the, the original act was passed. And so there's been an, an impasse and a lot of fighting in the courts, et cetera. Um, and we are now stuck with no clear roadmap to solving this problem. Let's talk a little bit more about that Georgia plant, the Vogel plant. That project was seven years behind schedule and cost $20 billion more to build than its original price tag, monies that ratepayers are largely paying for via surcharges and rate hikes. That seems to suggest perhaps we ought to reconsider our bet on nuclear. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, now you're talking about the cost of new nuclear, and it's very, very, very expensive. It's one of the most expensive sources of energy out there in terms of capital costs. So yes, one has to make decisions, you know, about what's best for the community, society, etc. Governments may decide that they want to subsidize this nuclear power, but it's not competitive with solar, uh, wind, or ga natural gas. The nuclear disaster at Fukushima in Japan was 14 years ago. And I think those of us old enough remember well how much concern there was, not just for the people of Japan, but for the oceanic ecosystems where the spent fuel leaked. Have scientists been able to move the needle on safety since then? Yes. Um, you know, the accident in Japan was investigated by their version of Congress, the Japanese diet. And they found that the accident was created in part because of a collusion between government, the regulator, and industry. And so the regulator wasn't providing adequate oversight of the facility. And, uh, and there was too much interference from government and, and industry itself in the safety of the facility. And so it's very important to have an independent regulator, one that is free from industry and uh, political influence. But it's also important to learn other lessons from the Fukushima accident. One lesson that all uh, countries around the world that have nuclear power plants learned was that you should be planning for more than one reactor at a site to go down in an accident. Before that accident, nobody ever imagined that at a site where there's multiple reactors that all of them could be affected by a particular event. So they didn't have the backup equipment that they needed to respond adequately. And so that's been changed. All uh, US reactors have had to update their backup equipment and make it much safer and more robust. And the other thing to learn is about the uh, natural hazards that are out there, right? We didn't understand enough about earthquakes. And so Japan wasn't prepared adequately to withstand a, a massive tsunami, which is what in the end caused that accident. So that's something that uh, countries have to take into consideration as well. There's also been talk of investing in decommissioned nuclear reactors and possibly small modular reactors or SMRs. Can you please explain SMRs and also share your perspective on the viability of these strategies? Yeah, so small modular reactors are basically uh, reactors that are 300 megawatts in, in generating capacity or smaller. The reactors that exist in the U.S. right now are all around a thousand megawatts, so much larger. The reason that they're large is largely due to economies of scale. In other words, it's much cheaper to build one large reactor than 10 small ones. And we will see if that economic principle continues to hold. At the moment, small reactors don't exist. They only exist on paper. Nobody's built a demonstration model of any of them except a demonstration, one demonstration model in China and one demonstration model in Russia. And so right now we're still in theoretical land to a degree, 
there are uh, a couple companies that are beginning to build demonstration models and beginning to try to move forward. And we'll see, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. How much will these reactors cost? Uh, can they set up the supply chains needed? Will they be able to get the fuel supply? Because for some of these small modular reactor designs, the fuel is very different from that being used in our currently operating reactors. You also asked about decommissioned reactors and starting them up. I just want to clarify that if a reactor has been fully decommissioned or even partially decommissioned, it's probably unlikely that it will be restarted. So I think what's being looked at uh, at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania and at the Palisades plant in Michigan is plants that were shut down, but not yet decommissioned. And so the question is, can those be started up in there? There's active work being done at, um, at both of those facilities. It's not cheap to restart them. It's not like you just go in and flip the switch and turn them on. No, you have to update equipment, change out old equipment, and make sure that what you're operating operates safely. So it will take some years and uh, some investment of probably billions of dollars to get them up and running. The Trump administration has also talked about streamlining regulation with nuclear, as well as supporting co-location strategies whereby power-hungry data centers are co-located with nuclear to fuel those without burdening our energy grid. Does this approach make sense and will it make a difference? So co-location is, is interesting. Uh, that would be with new reactors, reactors that, as you said, don't contribute to the grid. It's going to be very expensive. Um, it's a very expensive proposition for these data centers. Reactors are not cheap. And, and why? Because you don't want a nuclear accident. Look at what happened in Japan. Uh, they lost 30% of their electricity supply almost overnight. It cost them hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And they're still dealing with the effects. So you don't want an accident. And so that means that you're your facility has to be very robust and built to a very high level of quality. And this costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of money to set up the supply chains. It costs a lot of money to, to produce the reactors. And so we'll see if this is going to be a reasonable bet. If they are hoping for small modular reactors, I would say that we're still more than a decade away, maybe even two decades until we get to commercialization. And that may not be a timeline that works for the folks who want the electricity for data centers. And they may end up not needing that electricity in part because we've seen recently with the, the deep seek AI that China produced, they use much less energy to produce that AI. So it may be that we've got a bit of a tempest in a teapot here, and there's really not going to be the high energy needs that have been predicted. And finally, can you share some reasons why we might be hopeful about the possibility of expanding nuclear power? There's a lot of interest and there's a lot of investor money being put into nuclear power. And so there's a, a broad support for it. But my observation is that nuclear power lives or dies on economics. And, uh, and so we'll see. Allison, thank you so much for being on The Excerpt. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.